everyone, and welcome to episode 17 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. When it comes to history, I think it's safe to say that there are queens, and then there are queens. Often, the long and colorful lives of medieval queens are shrunk down into a few posthumous lines in a chronicle, but even the most unremarkable queens had a huge amount of influence over the politics of the Middle Ages, although the traces they leave behind may be scant. And then there are the queens who are written about with shock and disapproval in the chronicles because they dared to step out from behind the shadow of their male counterparts to wield the power of their crowns in full. Unlike medieval chroniclers, I can't get enough of powerful queens, so I invited Dr. Helen Castor to speak with me about queenship and the challenges of studying even the most prominent medieval women. Helen is a fellow and the former director of history at Sydney Sussex College at the University of Cambridge. She's the author of several books on amazing women, including She-Wolves, The Women Who Ruled England Before Elizabeth, Joan of Arc, A History, and recently, Elizabeth I, A Study in Insecurity. You may also have spotted her on some of your favorite documentaries, including ones on both She-Wolves and Joan of Arc, as well as, most recently, England's Forgotten Queen, The Life and Death of Lady Jane Grey. Here's our conversation about some of our favorite English queens and how the challenges they faced are still resonating today. Thanks, Helen, for joining us to talk about queenship today, especially English queenship. I'm so happy to have you here. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. So as I've just said, your your specialty is English queenship, but I think that we could generally talk about queenship in asking the question, what was the role of the queen in the Middle Ages? A good place to start, I think, is the word itself, because the word queen in its Anglo-Saxon roots means the wife of a king. So from the very etymological roots of the whole idea, we can see that it's an idea that is divided by sex. The king rules, the queen is his wife, the queen is his supporter, she's a supplement to what he does. Primarily, of course, she needs to give him air. Her main role is reproduction. Uh, That is the way that the crown will be passed on from generation to generation. Beyond that, her role is to bring the positive attributes of femaleness to the work of the crown. And we have to be very careful that those are the positive attributes because medieval culture wasn't at all sure about womankind. If we go back to Eve, Adam and Eve, the the biblical origins, we see that Eve was very much Adam's sidekick. She was created from his rib, but she was also the one who led him into temptation, into tasting the apple from the tree of knowledge. So women were always a bit dangerous. They could be uh, lustful, irrational, sinful, weak. They had to be kept in check, but a good woman would be merciful, nurturing, a helpmeet. And therefore, what queens could do is encourage their husbands to be merciful, to be just, to be charitable, could kind of soften the power of the crown, which in its full force tended to be military and legal, tended to be very assertive. So what we see are are queens having babies and softening the rough edges of medieval kingship. They were often intercessors in that sometimes people would come and appeal their case to the queen, hoping that she would take it up with the king. Is that right? That's right. So the idea that royal justice needed to be impartial and ferocious when it needed to be, but mercy was important too. And so the queen as intercessor, the queen as the one person who could get her down on her knees to appeal to her husband to not let the full force of his law fall on the heads of whichever person was currently under his gaze. And the other way that queens could help would be as a peacemaker, you know, in a sense, asking for mercy between countries as well as on behalf of individuals. Those were accepted roles for a queen and ways in which a virtuous queen could show her virtue. And this was another way in which kings could still be ferocious and they could save face as well. So this was kind of a partnership that worked in that the king could say something that was quite harsh. And then if the queen interceded, this would not make him lose face if he if he bowed to her wishes. Exactly, because she was his wife and she was 
fulfilling her proper role in appealing to him. And if he softened at her request, that was a virtuous thing for him to do too. It showed that his judgment had not been compromised overall, but that he'd been persuaded that this case was a special case and his wife's merciful and peace-loving nature had persuaded him to soften just in this one case for special reasons. So we're talking about queens interceding in terms of country to country negotiation, but what other cases would queens intercede on? It could be all sorts of things. I mean, it could be particular subjects of the king who had got themselves into legal or judicial trouble in some way. It could also be, I'm thinking of Edward III and his wife, Philippa of Hainault, who was much beloved of the king and also of his people. The case of the burghers of Calais, when the siege of Calais came to its conclusion, and Philippa appealed to Edward for their lives. And in appealing for their lives, Philippa was showing herself to be merciful. She was allowing Edward to be merciful. And one of the important things here to remember is that queens were usually, in English medieval history, to take that example, they were representatives of a, if you like, foreign element within the polity. So that could lead to problems sometimes if they were perceived as being foreign in a, an unhelpful way, bringing too many foreigners into court or, or, or some such criticism. But in the case of someone like Philippa of Hainault and the, and the conflict between England and France that uh, went on for decades during her husband's reign, the fact that she could bring a sort of more international diplomatic perspective in an entirely trustworthy way. That was another way in which the Queen could function within the polity when things were going well. And I think that's important that you bring up because most medieval queens did come from outside. Um, in your book, which is She Wolves, which we should get to in a second, you so you start with Empress Matilda, who was the daughter of the king, and then you end with Elizabeth, who was also the daughter of the king. But most of the ones in between, as you're saying, they're they're foreign born, and so their role was to to be these peace weavers, these peacemakers. So your book is called She Wolves: The Women Who Ruled England Before Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Why did you call it she-wolves? It was a term that, well, it goes back to Shakespeare, who in writing in his Henry VI plays about Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou, calls her she-wolf of France and goes on to say, but worse than wolves of France. Um, so it's, it's a description that gets at the, I was going to say deep ambivalence, but in fact, deep hostility that is shown culturally in the Middle Ages and on into the 16th century to women who step outside the role that we've just been describing. Women who dare to assume that they might have political agency. Women who step onto the political stage and want to exercise power in some way for themselves. They tend to be characterized in this fascinated but repelled way as something almost feral, something grotesque, something deeply unvirtuous, something dangerous, because they are transgressing the bounds of what a virtuous woman would do. And the, the way the she-wolf gets talked about points us at something else too, because a she-wolf is often talked about in relation to her cubs. So we might look to the role of queens as mothers. In Margaret of Anjou's case, that was exactly what she was doing. She was stepping forward into the political arena in the context of the more or less uselessness of her husband, Henry VI, in order to protect, defend, and if she could, to push forward the rights and the interests of her son, Edward. I think it's a really apt title for the women that you've chosen, because you've chosen Empress Matilda, Isabella of France, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and Margaret of Anjou. And of those, only Isabella, you could say, was really successful in rebellion, but all of them really pushed to get their sons advanced. So I think it's really apt to have them as she-wolves. So these women, why did you choose these women in particular? In a sense, they chose themselves. The book started where the book actually starts. If you open the book, it starts with a scene of Edward VI 
the only son of Henry VIII on his deathbed at the age of 15. And that was the scene that was in my mind when I started thinking about this book, because it suddenly occurred to me. And and in a way, it's, it's weird that it hadn't occurred to me before. But I think the story of the Tudors is so familiar to us all that sometimes we forget to go back and really look at it and look at the moments when things could have been very different. But that was a moment in 1553, the death of Edward VI, that was momentous for more than one reason. At that point, despite all the efforts of Henry VII and Henry VIII, the first two Tudor kings, to have sons, all their determination, all their focus on that, at this point in 1553, Edward VI, Henry VIII's only son, was dying without a male heir. And everywhere else on the Tudor family tree, there were only women. So like it or not, and in general, Tudor England didn't like it, there was going to be a reigning Queen of England for the very first time. And when I started thinking about that, so rather than thinking about in detail, was it going to be Jane Grey or was it going to be his half-sister Mary and so on, I started thinking about the whole idea of female power and female rule. And once I did that, it occurred to me that it was exactly 400 years earlier, in 1153, that Matilda, or rather not Matilda herself, but her right in the person of her son, Henry II, had finally taken the throne of England. So it immediately threw me back to thinking about Matilda, who could have been the first reigning Queen of England, and in fact, in lots of ways, and her supporters certainly thought so, she thought so, should have been the first reigning Queen of England. So once I had those two ideas in my head that I wanted to tell the story of 1553 and the beginning of the rule of the Tudor Queens, I also wanted to tell the story of Matilda and how she almost but not quite became Queen, reigning Queen, ruling Queen of England. I then started wondering about the 400 years in between. And when I did that, these other three women immediately leapt into focus. Three women who, even though they were queen's consort, they didn't have a hereditary right to rule England themselves. They all did at one point or another in their lives exercise royal power. Eleanor of Aquitaine ruled England on behalf of her son, Richard the Lionheart, while he was away on crusade and then latterly captured on his way back from crusade. Isabella of France overthrew her own husband, Edward II, in the name of their son and ruled England with her lover at her side. It's one of the most extraordinary Games of Throny stories that you could come across. (laughs) And then Margaret of Anjou, confronted with the hopelessness of her husband, Henry VI, and the Wars of the Roses, as we call them, erupting all around her, stepped into the breach to try to hold the Lancastrian cause together in the name of her husband on behalf of her son. So, in a sense, it was that train of thought, and the women chose themselves once that train of thought got going. It makes a lot of sense. And I think it's worth mentioning maybe a little bit about Matilda, because I'm not sure everyone knows who Matilda was. So can you tell us briefly why she would have been queen if things had worked out in her favour? Matilda was the daughter of King Henry I, who was the son, the youngest son of William the Conqueror. So Matilda was William the Conqueror's granddaughter. And by the time of her father's death in 1135, she was his only surviving child. She had had a brother, William, who had died in a shipwreck in 1120, the famous story of the white ship that went down with a crew and passengers completely drunk at night trying to race off into the into the dark sea. So her brother had died 15 years earlier. And the big question was whether or not a woman could rule. In Anglo-Saxon England, before the conquest, only male heirs had ever been considered. There wasn't a strict hereditary principle or rather All the male heirs of the royal bloodline were in the frame and the best suited candidate was chosen to be king, or at least that was the theory. There was often a lot more fighting than that, but that was the theory. But once the Normans started ruling England, the principle on which they were working was something much more like the hereditary principle that we're used to, but it still wasn't set in stone. William the Conqueror himself had been illegitimate by birth. Henry I, Matilda's father, had been his youngest son who succeeded his second son, William Rufus, onto the English throne, even though their older brother, Robert, was still alive. So in a sense, everything was there to play for. Even though the assumption was that rule was male, there was no explicit 
law or principle to say that a woman couldn't rule. And Henry, Henry I, certainly seems to have wanted his own blood to succeed him. He, before his death, made his nobles swear an oath that they would support Matilda as his heir. Matilda herself seems absolutely to have believed that she should be his heir. But the difficulty she found herself in, in 1135, when her father died, was that she was not in England. She was in France. She was married to the Count of Anjou. And of course, her father ruled Normandy as well as England. But she was in the early stages of her third pregnancy pregnancy. And before she could get herself to England to make her claim, to substantiate her claim, her cousin Stephen raced to Winchester, where he took control of the royal treasury and had himself crowned before anyone else really knew what was happening. And at that point, with a familiarly male king, already anointed and crowned, already made king by God, if you like. We have to take very seriously what the coronation meant. Matilda was always at a disadvantage, quite apart from the fact that she was female, which put her at a disadvantage anyway. But the interesting thing is that the result of all of this was not that Matilda's claim was simply laughed out of court and discounted. Instead, the result was 19 years of civil war. People were prepared to support Matilda's claim, as well as people being prepared to fight for Stephen. So this is really a test of Matilda as a potential leader, and also a test of the whole idea of whether a woman could, in fact, be an acceptable monarch. Her story is fascinating. Matilda's story, because not only does it have this fight for the crown, which it's hard to say was not hers. I mean, there's a lot of people that are on Stephen's side, but I have to say I'm on Matilda's side (laughs) in this case. But not only is there a fight for the crown and civil war, but Matilda also made a whole bunch of dashing escapes. Matilda was clearly very, very brave indeed. Um, The famous one is is a midwinter escape from Oxford where she's supposed to have wrapped herself in a white cloak to trudge undetected across a snowy landscape. She was tough, she was uncompromising, she was brave, and she was insistent on her rights just as her father always was, her father who was known as the Lion of Justice, who was known for the ferocity, the inflexibility of his demands that his authority should be recognised. But the difficulty that Matilda found herself in was that when she tried to assert those rights, people didn't respond in the same way as they had done to her father. They started saying that she was arrogant and haughty and unwomanly and unfeminine, and that she wasn't listening as she should do to what her advisers told her. And what they seem to have meant by that is not just listen to your advisers, but do what your advisers tell you, because they are men and you are a woman. And unsurprisingly, um, Matilda didn't take the view that that was appropriate. (laughs) But what became clear was that really she was caught in a catch-22. If she acted like a king... The fact that she was female undermined her actions because the whole idea of a female king was unprecedented. What would it even mean and how could it be right, given that, as St. Paul tells us in the Bible, man is the head of woman. So what does it then mean to have a woman in supreme command as sovereign of a whole kingdom? There was a mismatch there. And the reaction that we see in the Chronicles to the idea of this woman issuing commands, assuming royal authority, just as any man would do, is deeply hostile, deeply negative. And in the end, it's a catch-22 that Matilda struggles with throughout, but can't quite overcome. And it's it's both interesting and disheartening to see that still happening today, <laughs> where uh, a woman who tries to be the same type of boss as a man is is criticized in that same way as, as being arrogant or above their station. There's a wonderful line in an essay by Rebecca Solnit about the 2016 American election. When she's talking about Hillary Clinton, she says that Clinton was accused of being ambitious in standing yes. for president. And Solnit says that's a quality which it's safe to assume Clinton shares with every politician who's ever run for office, ever. And yet, when you're a woman running for president, it's a criticism. <laughs> 
It's exactly the same thing. <laughs> it is. And I mean, that's both useful for us as historians. And also, you know, it makes you just shake your head, I think. It really does. It really does. When you're looking at Matilda's story more than 800 years ago, and you're recognizing the political dynamics this closely, it tells you how much we still have to fight for. <laughs> Yes, yes. And you have Matilda's epitaph in there, which I think is interesting, which says, great by birth, greater by marriage, greatest in her offspring. Here lies the daughter, wife and mother of Henry. And I remember reading an article and I've, I've forgotten who wrote it. So I'll try and find that for the show notes. But someone talking about this kind of epitaph as being erasing for the actual accomplishments of the queens who had lived. So what do you think about that kind of remembering these queens in terms of the role? and maybe not in terms of their actual actions. What do you think about that? I think it tells us an awful lot that the safe place for a woman to be, the acceptable place for a woman to be a royal woman in this period is as a daughter, as a wife and as a mother. And if she's working behind the scenes in an entirely supportive way to support her father, her husband and her son, that's absolutely fine. But if she dares step out in front of them, even beside them in some cases, then that starts to become a problem. And the fact that Matilda's name doesn't even appear (laughs) in that two line epitaph that she is defined entirely in relation to the three Henrys, her father, Henry I, I should explain her first husband, the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry V, with whom she didn't have any children. Her second husband, Geoffrey of Anjou, was the father of her children. But her son, Henry, that's the relationship that we might look a little more closely at, because for all that Matilda is accused of being, and and this is accused by contemporaries and by generations of historians thereafter, of being arrogant and haughty, It's Matilda's own very fine judgment that eventually brings the civil war to an end, where she makes a peace treaty with her opponent, Stephen, by which Stephen will continue to rule, but he recognises Matilda's son, Henry, as his heir. So Matilda herself, in the end, takes the decision to step aside. So in a way, the epitaph reflects Matilda's own judgment, Matilda's own decision about what the best way to get her claim to the throne recognized is through the the familiarly male person of her son. But I think we as historians owe her a bit more than that. Yes. And even Henry himself called himself Fitz Empress as kind of a nod to his mother and all of all of the trials she went through. He did. And she, for as long as she lived, was one of his closest and most trusted counsellors. I think Henry, who was a formidable ruler in his own right, had a very clear sense of his mother's calibre and quite how much he owed her. And for for Matilda, as well as Margaret of Anjou, it's kind of straightforward, I think, in that you have a very clear case for the son being put forward as a ruler. And then you have Eleanor and you have Isabella, who have to make the choice between a king who seems to be ruling maybe not well, but he's ruling, and their sons who they think would be better at it. So these two are very interesting to me. Uh, what do you what do you get out of these stories of Eleanor and Isabella thinking that they knew better as to who should be ruling? What do you think about those two? I think I might adjust the way you've characterized it just ever so slightly, because I think rather than thinking that their sons would be better at ruling than their husbands, I, I think both of them actually at the point they stepped forward, thought they would be better at ruling than their husband. (laughs) I think you're right. I think you're right. (laughs) They were two formidable women. Um, I have to say, Eleanor in particular is someone I take all available hats off to. She is an extraordinary character. um, And perhaps we can say a bit more about her in a minute. But what you're referring to is that in 1173, Eleanor took the side of her sons when they decided to rebel against her husband, Henry II. But I think the interesting thing there is to look in detail at what was precipitating Eleanor and her sons into this resistance. And actually, it seems to have been the same grievances that Eleanor had on her own behalf that her sons had on theirs. That is that Henry, who ruled an extraordinary collection of territories that stretched all the way from the English border with Scotland all the way down to the Pyrenees, had been promising his sons and promising Eleanor 
that they would get some delegated power. He would give them bits of this empire to rule. And in fact, he hadn't followed through. And in Eleanor's case, that was particularly intense, a particularly intense resentment because the territory that he'd handed over to her was her own in the first place. She was the heir to the great Duchy of Aquitaine. She had brought it to Henry. In fact, she'd brought it to Henry after 15 years being married to the King of France. Her marriage to the King of France had been annulled and eight weeks later she'd married Henry who was about to become King of England. So he only had Aquitaine because of her. And after her years of childbearing were over, she went back to Aquitaine and was set to rule it as Henry's lieutenant there. But Henry, who was nothing if not a control freak, uh, <laughs> not let go in the end. And the kind of delegated authority that he had apparently offered his wife and his sons was not in the end forthcoming. So when Eleanor took this remarkable decision to rebel alongside her sons in 1173, it wasn't just to support them. It was also because of her grievances about what was happening on her own account in Aquitaine. But the interesting thing there is the different contemporary responses to her sons and to her. It's not that her son's rebellion was approved of, you know, they, they were characterised as ungrateful sons and, you know, resisting their father and their sovereign was clearly not a straightforwardly good thing to do. But it was understood, the idea of young men wanting to stretch their wings, flex their muscles and so on. It was not an appalling crime against nature. But for Eleanor, it really was an appalling crime against nature in the view of a great many politicians and churchmen. And the punishment that was inflicted on her went far beyond what was inflicted on her boys. Essentially, she spent the next 15 years as her husband's prisoner. Uh, probably in rather comfortable custody, but nevertheless, her freedom of action was entirely taken away from her. Yes, her wings were really clipped, which he probably knew would be the worst punishment he could give her, even if she was in comfortable circumstances. Yeah. We are talking about looking at women's history, and that is your specialty. The books that you've written about have been about women, and I think that the way you, in which you write them shows a lot of sensitivity in terms of the things that you see when you read between the lines, and I'm thinking especially about your work on Joan of Arc and her imprisonment, because it wasn't until I read your book on Joan of Arc that I really saw her imprisonment in different terms, in feminine terms. And I was thinking about your work in studying these women and wondering if you find that there are special challenges in looking into women's history um, over time. Very much so. I should explain perhaps that I didn't start out as a historian of women. By training, by instinct, by my own history, I'm a historian of power. I've always been interested in how power works, particularly in the Middle Ages and on into the 16th century, when you don't have the institutional framework of power that we're used to now. So you don't, for instance, have a standing army, you don't have a police force, you don't have instant communications, you don't have motorized transport. How do you actually rule a country or an empire without all those things? And I've always been fascinated by the way that exposes mechanisms of power and particularly the way it exposes the qualities, good and bad, of individuals at the top of those structures. And so that was my training that then brought me to look at the role of women within these power structures, because they were so overwhelmingly male. All the assumptions about what exercising power meant, what it entailed, were all male. So I became absolutely fascinated by the idea of what it meant how it worked, whether it worked at all for a woman to try to step into a space where there was no neutral ground for her at all and where all the tools she was trying to use were shaped for male hands. So among the challenges is precisely to read women's experience through the remains of a culture that just takes it absolutely for granted that women's voices do not speak in the same way that men's do, that women don't act in the same way that men do, that women are fundamentally different creatures, are created by God differently from men. But then when you actually go and look at the records, of course, it means that you do hear very few female voices, that 
women's power was most often exercised behind the scenes, what we would now call soft power, influence, conversations behind the scenes, advice behind the scenes, you know, all all that stuff that we get to see in Game of Thrones, but don't get to see in the formal public records of medieval government. So then trying to read between those lines becomes an absolutely absorbing challenge. I mean, I'll give you one example, if if I may. Eleanor of Aquitaine, as I've said, was Queen of France for 15 years. And after 15 years of marriage, that marriage was annulled. And very shortly thereafter, Eleanor married Henry of England. Now, the way that annulment, the end of her marriage to Louis VII of France, the way that has always been characterised is that Louis decided to get rid of her. Louis must have decided to get rid of her because Louis was the one with agency. She had only given him two daughters. He didn't have a son. He needed a son. She had been controversial. She'd been scandalous in various ways. She'd been suspected of having an affair with her uncle when they were off on crusade, etc., etc. He was cutting his losses. He was going to get rid of her. But the more I looked at this, the more that just didn't make sense. Their two daughters were very small. The younger was not yet two. There was no way in which she was decidedly infertile. And in fact, she went on to have a whole handful of sons with Henry in the first six years of their marriage, which was <laughs> a bit slow for Louis. But it just didn't make sense to me. All all the chronicles talk of how much Louis loved her. But most importantly, she had the right to the Duchy of Aquitaine. And if she stopped being Queen of France, if she left Louis because she didn't have a son, Aquitaine would go with her. And that is, in fact, what happened. She took Aquitaine to Henry of England and totally changed the balance of power in France. So the more I looked at it, the more the evidence was suggesting that it was Eleanor who wanted out of that marriage, not Louis. She'd been unhappy with him from the very beginning. She tried to get out of the marriage already or when they were on their way back from crusade. So I don't have any evidence for what I'm about to tell you in the sense <laughs> I can't point to a document. I can't, I can't demonstrate that this is decidedly true. But it seemed to me that one thing that would make sense is that if Eleanor wanted out of her marriage to Louis, she hadn't yet given him a son. If she refused to have sex with him anymore, if she refused to sleep with him, he would have no chance of a son ever because how could he get out of this marriage? But equally, where would his male heir come from? If she threatened him with that, then that might be something she could do behind the scenes to get herself out, despite the fact that she would take Aquitaine with her. And the fact that she did not protest at all about the annulment proceedings, she simply took herself off immediately and eight weeks and two days later was married to Henry, suggests to me that actually if someone was planning this, it was probably Eleanor. As I say, I can't prove it to you, but that (laughs) is a start that makes much more sense to me than the suggestion that Louis was the one driving this all along. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense to me. And in fact, I'm as you're talking, I'm thinking Nancy Goldstone has a mug that says that history makes much more sense when you put the women back into it. <laughs> it really does. And to go back to you mentioned Joan of Arc, the other thing we need to do, I think, is try to not only make sense through the women, but try to see things through women's eyes. Again, we talked earlier on about the fact that queens were usually foreign brides, diplomatic alliances, women who'd come from other countries. That makes sense politically. It has a use politically. I think we perhaps take it for granted so much that we don't think about the human reality of what it was like for these women, usually very young. Matilda was sent off to Germany as the bride of the Holy Roman Emperor when she was about eight. I mean, they didn't marry till she was almost 12, but um, but she was sent away to be brought up at his court from the age of about eight. Isabella of France was married to Edward II at the age of 12. Eleanor of Aquitaine was married to Louis, who would become Louis VII at the age of 13. Margaret of Anjou, also a teenager. These are women who go through tremendous challenges just in the very fact of their marriages. They're sent away from home with only a very, very few familiar companions, and they have to make new lives in a different country, speaking in many cases a different language, and acclimatizing themselves to a very challenging political role in a country that to begin with, they simply don't know. And there's an equivalent process in thinking about Joan of Arc. I think most of us who know something about her story are very aware of her bravery in battle and also at her trial when she stands alone in a room full of clerics and makes an extraordinarily articulate defence of her position. 
But perhaps what we're less aware of, because it's not described in detail in the trial transcript, is the situation she faced at the end of every day at the trial where she was taken back to her cell and she was a lone woman in a castle, or certainly in the bit of the castle she was in, full of men, full of soldiers, soldiers outside her room, soldiers in her room. The whole question of her clothes, her why she wore men's clothes, which was extremely controversial and difficult to justify in religious terms. I mean, she didn't have difficulty justifying it to, in her own terms, but um, <laughs> that that's what God wanted her to do. But it was it was a huge focus of the kind of ecclesiastical response to her. Simply her physical safety in those circumstances, if we start thinking about that, then a whole element of her experience starts to sort of unfold in our imagination, I think. Yes, and and that's what I really appreciated about your work because I hadn't come across that before. I hadn't thought about that, and maybe we don't. Maybe we don't think about that in terms of the human element, in terms of these female bodies going through their world, going through their lives. And so I think it's really important. And I'm sure that you have some pushback with people saying that you write in a way that is too sensitive, that is too female. <laughs> but I really appreciate the way you do it. You know, I, I when she was came out, I was braced for that. I when I when it was first published and I started going out giving talks on the whole subject, talking about various of these women, I was braced for people to to push back in exactly the way that you've described. And actually I've had remarkably little of that. I mean, one thing that I try to do in all of my work, I try very hard to root the perspective from which I'm talking in the time that I'm talking about. So, for instance, in She Wolves, I very deliberately didn't use any terms that are often used in women's history now, any sort of more theoretical terms, because they were not terms that were used, you know, even the word gender was not used in the Middle Ages. Women's role was understood completely in terms of biological sex and the idea that society might construct meaning on the basis of biological sex was was not one that came into the into the mix it just was god had created the world in this order and this is how it was supposed to be so because i'm always talking as far as i can from the perspective you know as far as i'm capable as far as my research allows me to from the perspective of my protagonists living in the 14th 15th whichever century i wonder whether that has helped communicate some of these experiences or maybe simply deflected some of the pushback. I don't know. A, a friend of mine described She Wolves once as a work of covert feminism. And I <laughs> like that because that does describe well what I was trying to do. I, I was trying to tell the stories in their own terms, but it did seem to me that there were very, very important resonances that might speak to us now at the same time. Yes, and they do. And that, I mean, that is that is my whole mission in life is to really bring people together across time and really show how similar we are. And and a lot of the challenges that these queens faced, as we've talked about, they, they are still echoing today. So I really appreciate your work. I'm glad that you're doing it. And I'm so glad that you came on the podcast today to talk to us about it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle, so much. It's been a complete pleasure. To find out more about Helen's work, you can follow her on Twitter at HRCaster. That's H-R-C-A-S-T-O-R. Elizabeth I, A Study in Insecurity, comes out in paperback this Friday in the US, UK and Australia, next month in Canada. As one last quick note, the article I referred to on medieval queens and their epitaphs is Just the Good Wife, Death and Legacy of Noble Women in the Middle Ages by Mariah Luther Cooper, which you can find on the Public Medievalist. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. So what's new this week, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Well, this week we've been really busy covering the uh, fire at Notre Dame de Cathedral. So we've had kind of several posts that have gone out through the week. Uh, so if you're interested in like um, catching up on what kind of uh, interesting reads there has been, uh, about the uh, cathedral, about the fire, about kind of the, all the politics around the restoration. We have we have some things on that. We also have a, a special page to tell you if you want to support the res uh, the rebuilding of Notre Dame. We have a kind of page that tells you kind of what are the different uh, uh, charitable options. So you can go there. Um, 
So in non-Notre Dame uh, kind of pieces, uh, there's a, a kind of an interesting news article that went out today on Crusader genetics. Uh, so that's uh, about um, uh, several uh, bodies that were discovered in Lebanon and what what that says about where the Crusaders came from uh, and their kind of genetic legacy. So, And we also have this one really kind of interesting and dark piece it's by ken bondeshine he's our medievalism columnist and his piece for this month is entitled the black metal folkish heathenism church burning and medievalism so not the happiest of stories but uh but it, it's uh, been uh, fairly popular on our site this this week so those are the things i would recommend uh our listeners to check out on medievalist.net thanks peter thanks as of last week, the Medieval Podcast has been downloaded over 31,000 times since we started in January, and I want to thank each and every one of you for making this little slice of history a part of your lives. Thanks especially to the people who have taken a minute to give us a rating, and for those who have become patrons on Patreon. If you want to be part of our Patreon community and help out the podcast while also getting a sweet deal on Medieval Warfare magazine, head on over to patreon.com slash medievalists. For all your favorite medieval content, you can follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, there too, at 5min medievalist or 5 minute medievalist. And if you still want more, you can find my books on Amazon, where you can even pre order the new one Life in Medieval Europe Fact and Fictions. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks so much for tuning in every week. Have yourself a great day.